Hey everybody, how you doing? Bob Vokes here for the Gilly Glue. Got some exciting things happening today. Very different little angle that we're taking today. We have a friend and a visitor that came to here to our Preston Street location and had a, a fantastic conversation with us about foraging uh, for mushroom, wild mushrooms particularly, but foraging for a lot of wild edibles, what to look for, what to pay attention to, the learning curve that you need to take, which is very, very important when you're out foraging for things. But I really just wanted to take a, a few minutes to introduce this episode. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Uh, I will provide all the notes uh, and uh, contact information for the Wild Yam on her YouTube channel. She does a lot of cabin life, a lot of bush life, uh, a lot of trail camera stuff. She does a lot of wild foraging for wild edibles, particularly mushrooms, how you can cook with them, a whole host of different things that she does. And I think you'll really find it inform informative. So Hope you enjoy it. Leave us lots of comments. Hit that subscribe button and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Have a great day. Hey everybody, how you doing today? Bob Vokes here for the Gilly Galoo. Got some fun stuff happening today. I've got my friend here, fellow YouTuber, a uh, huge resource that we really wanted to bring some, some really cool information. We have the Wild Yam here today. Check out our YouTube channel called The Wild Yam. Jen, thanks so much for coming to the Gilly Galoo here on Preston Street today. Well, thanks Bob. It's a real pleasure to be back again. I really enjoy coming to chat with you. Um, Wild Yam and I met uh, through YouTube, which is kind of a unique thing in terms of the time of, uh, that we live in and this era of uh, social media and information and how we were able to exchange information and what we're able to do. And we've become friends through that. Uh, we've, I visited her cabin. It's my turn now to get her to our cabin. <laughs> <laughs> tag you're in. <laughs> yeah, tag I'm it. Um, but we certainly wanted to come. Uh, she also came to our Preston Street store here a while back and uh, was gracious enough to interview me and uh, allow us to be on her YouTube channel and, uh, and expose to her audience. And so we wanted to reciprocate and do the same thing here. So today we're going to bring up a, a variety of different things, but we're going to be talking about wild edibles and foraging and some of those types of things that uh, a lot of people are becoming more aware of and more interested in. And we'll find out how uh, Jen got involved and what happened and what went there. So, but first Jen, maybe you could just kind of tell us a little bit about yourself, how you became to, you know, interested in the cabin life and uh, wild edibles and how you got started and, and all that kind of stuff. Super. Yeah. Well, I've been a nature gal for a really long time, you know, since I was a little kid. Um, I grew up in southwestern Ontario uh, in an area actually only had 2% tree coverage, oh. uh, Essex County. So um, you can bet every chance I got after school and on weekends that I was in that 2% of uh, the woodlands yeah. in my area uh, exploring and uh, learning more about my natural environment. Um, so it led me to have a great love for, uh, for nature, animals, birds, um, you know. Not so much the plants and the fungi early on in my in my life. Uh, that kind of came on a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I took biology in school and all the way through, and uh, started getting more of an appreciation for all aspects of nature. Yes. Um, so I moved to uh, you know this area here in the Ottawa area uh, about nine years ago, and I really love it because it's a mixture of city as well as uh, not too far away from here. You know, you can get into to good bush life. So. I was going to say there's a, a hot, much higher percentage of forest in this area. Absolutely, that... absolutely, and we're you know we're working to improve that even you know because absolutely a lot of, uh, where I was from a lot of farmland um, took away from our natural forests and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we're working reforestation projects across the province. But I definitely love the Ottawa area for its sort of a, a very naturey feel, and uh, you know get taste of the city life as well. One thing you just uh, reminded me, and uh, I was at a, uh, a conference last year, uh, and the, it was about wild cats and cougars and all that. But the, one of the points that you know we all have these little ahas when we're attending something. One of the things that really captured me what this lady said, and she was from the the western U uh, yeah western U S uh, Utah and those places where she studied has studied wild cats for a long time. She said one of the reasons that is so attractive to the wild cats to become in this area is because of our forests. Absolutely. It's the li last track of natural forest yeah. that runs any distance between yeah. Quebec up through here and up into Renfrew County and up, you know, yeah. and further yeah. off into Northern Ontario. Yeah. So it was pretty interesting. So that's cool. Yeah. I mean, a lot more habitats getting fragmented, you know, yes. and that's very difficult. Uh, you know, a lot of animals affected by, you know, edge effects, you know, enhanced predation, parasitism, things like that. So it's nice to have all these continuous tracks of forest for a lot of our natural For creatures. their natural movements and their, mm -hmm. their uh, territorial uh, mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Perfect. Perfect. So you have a cabin in the bush. 
Yeah, so we moved to the Ottawa area um, a few years ago. We ended up uh, purchasing some land, mm -hmm. um, 170 acres there. Uh, of, uh, yeah, so it actually has a mixture of, uh, it was a, an old farm at one point, but it had a, a lot of bush as well. Uh, and so it has a lot of different habitats there. Uh, and so we used to start off by sort of hanging out there in a tent, um, but uh, <laughs> with the bugs and, you know. It's got to be done. Yeah. yeah a lot of the rain we get around here, uh, we decided to build a little off-grid cabin. And I really, really got interested in the, the off-grid idea, not being so dependent on a lot of, you know, city resources and things like that. Um, which led actually to me to learn a lot more about the land. That land has taught me a lot and continues to teach me a yeah, lot. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's where my, you know, I really ramped up my learning, you know, what, how can I help the forest and how in turn can it help me right. and, and others as well. Yeah, and, that, and that's where I think the, the collective awareness is being raised on, you know, the 100-mile diet, the, all of those things. So it's becoming more and more and more popular to do that, but also the dependency on, external environments for food and water and shelter and mm -hmm. we're we're kind of going backwards a little bit in that we're trying to uh, be a little more self-sufficient and Correct. things and it's yeah. bringing that awareness to uh, some wild edibles and things so it was a natural progression for you probably then to have your cabin be out in the wilderness start examining and learning and looking mm -hmm. and things and saying well wonder what I can eat and what I can eat. Is that the kind of way it started? Yeah, or? yeah exactly, yeah. exactly. And, you know, once my eyes started being open to all the, you know, the plants and the animals and the fungi around me, it was like opening the door to a grocery store. You just start, they just start highlighting. You just sort of see the woods in front of you and how, uh, you know, you can uh, sustain yourself uh, on a lot of, uh, you know, products mm -hmm. that you see in, in the wilderness. Um, a lot of things can be very harmful for you and so that's yeah. another thing when you're starting into this is uh, not only do you want to learn what you can eat and what you can responsibly harvest and share but you want to learn as well uh, things that can be extremely harmful to you at, at minimum that cause a lot of gastrointestinal <laughs> discomfort uh, yeah. at maximum you know they can kill you and so yeah. it's uh, yeah. and even like one little mushroom you know what I mean can cause a lot of damage so Absolutely. Um, you know when you're getting into this it's really really important to uh, to uh, really uh, get a good solid knowledge base and uh, reach out to experts and and, and things like that and there, it's as you uncover into a new world of things all of a sudden there's all these people that have been doing all kinds of things right you yes know? it's amazing it's, how many people that are you know catch the the bug for wild edibles and, and the mushroom bug as I like to call it yeah um, you know there's a, a, just a plethora of knowledge out there and, and experts as well as non-experts that you have to be wary of um, but uh, you know certainly there's lots of information out there tons and tons and tons yeah it's a great thing um, so then you got started into the wild edibles and you started researching and, and things so what would if someone for someone that you know said oh, I'd love to do that and and they wanted to get started what maybe would be a two or three or so key points to obviously some field guides and things that you brought with you today mm -hmm. but you know like you're out in the field and there's a nice little orange mushroom over there and there's a bunch of little red ones over there and yeah, yeah. Like, so what's the key features to get started that can sort of uh, immediately help you get started Right. So, I mean, right off the bat, just a thirst for knowledge and wanting to learn more about your environment. Um, so start off by, um, you know, educating yourself first before you want to pick and grab and sort of look at things that may, may not be toxic to you. Um, so I have a few good field guides that I like to go to, in particular, um, you know, talking a lot about mushrooms today. Mm -hmm. um, really good one. Um, you guys are probably familiar with the National Audubon Society. Um, here's a good book here, Foraging for Mushrooms. And uh, it's got, you know, 762 beautiful color plates of pictures which wow, is really yeah, important you yeah. know when you know we're talking about little orange mushrooms and things there's it's you know divided into various different categories to help you sort of um, take a look at what you're what you're seeing um, and so that's a really good one for more advanced uh, you know mushrooms that are more you know related to edible and edible fungi of North America there's this one by uh, the Millers there I really like that one it's more advanced uh, certainly it's, it's really helpful because it has a lot of you know, general mushrooming information in there as well as uh, keys to sort of help you, um, you know, identify what you're seeing. So, you know, I found a little, you know, white gilled mushroom. Okay, we're going to look in the agarics and sort of go from there. Um, and so it sort of helps you kind of sort through the information. I say it's a little bit more advanced because uh, it teaches you all about the anatomy of a mushroom. You know, we pick mushrooms, it's, it's the fruiting body right. of a much larger organism. And a lot of it lives underground or within, you know, wood or things like that. Hmm, that's um, interesting. So we've got the mycelium, which is sort of like the little network of, of roots and things like that. And then um, sort of like roots rather. And, uh, you know, the fruiting body, uh, so the reproductive structure, the mushroom is actually what we're, what we're picking. Um, so uh, certainly, 
these books are excellent. There's lots of others as well out there. Amazon, you know, go on chapters, uh, lots of good books there. Um, for specific regions, you know, if you're, say, in Algonquin Park, and that's a beautiful place to go looking all times of year for mushrooms, um, you know, the, the Friends of Algonquin Park has a wonderful publication oh, here yeah, cool. uh, of all the mushrooms they have there. And, uh, you know, just excellent discussion of, uh, you know, mushrooms that you can see there. So, yes, yeah, so certainly starting with, uh, you know, a lot of resources, going in very cautiously. You don't want to be too bold when you start into uh, foraging wild edibles or mushrooms. And I would advise, you know, learning a few mushrooms that, you know, really have not a lot of deadly, no deadly lookalikes, you know, and are very, <laughs> how I start too is looking for mushrooms that are extremely distinctive in their characteristics. So you can't, so that you not really can't make you know, a wrong decision. Yeah. Or the, you know, the, the, the only other one you could pick, you know, wouldn't, uh, you know, cause extreme problems, maybe a little bit of a, you know, nausea or something like that. Um, you know, so I started off with some mushrooms that were fairly easy to identify in the field. Uh, and I kind of went from there. And, uh, you know, certainly a lot of people getting into mushrooming, mushroom foraging, uh, usually focus on two to three species a year and just you just know them cold you know what they look like you found their false lookalikes you know cold what they look like um, <laughs> and uh, you know and also really really important to know your deadly mushrooms yeah, absolutely uh, you know the amanita mushrooms uh, are, are a big one your little uh, you know ghostly white mushrooms with a ring you know I would definitely stay away from those <laughs> um, there are some that are non deadly that look like that but you just you want to be a hundred percent before you put anything in your mouth uh, when when in doubt, throw it out is the yeah. big thing we talk about when we Perfect. do mushroom foraging. So. You just made me think, kind of, in for the birders that are watching. Um, anytime I was at a doing a talk for a seniors group this week, and we they they were so about well, what's that bird and what's this bird and what? And I said, guys, you know, before you try to figure out everything that you see mm -hmm. coming at you, start to figure out species. Mm -hmm. So we started to talk about characteristics, say, of the warblers as an example, or yeah. as finches as an example. Right. If you figure out that body style mm -hmm. and the characteristics of a finch, yeah. then when you look at something, you can immediately say, well, that's a finch. Right. So that would be the same kind of a thing with mushrooms. Right. So one, one example is, uh, you know, the bolete group of mushrooms. You know, they are very different. They don't have the gills that you would expect to see. And by the gills, you know, when you flip under the cap of a mushroom, say the one you get at the grocery store, you see these little plates there that are yep. called gills. Yep. Uh, boletes actually have pores underneath the surface of the cap, so little tiny holes. So, you know, you can, you know, and they have that a stalk and a very sort of a bulbous uh, cap. Um, and so, you know, when you flip them over, there are pores underneath. So right away, I know that's going to be a bolete. Um, you know, when it has that kind of structure, yep. then you move on from there. Now, bolides can be a bit difficult. You know, sometimes you need keys right. to identify them. Sometimes you need DNA sequencing. That's what I was learning. You know, some uh -huh. of these mushrooms, uh, you can go into a microscope, do all these other kind of chemical tests to determine what they are, but really it's down to the DNA sequencing nowadays to know exactly what species you're dealing with with some of the more complex mushrooms. Wow. Lots to learn and lots of fun. But that, I really like that uh, kind of analogy between species of birds and things. And yeah. the uh, seniors group that I was talking with the other night, it's funny how we all get our ahas on things. Mm -hmm. You know, so a couple of things you just mentioned really sort of went, oh. Now, I, when I see those mushrooms, and when we've been out in the forest together, we've been looking at things. I now go, when I'm out on my own, mm -hmm. start to look at those key features yeah. first. Yeah. And say, well, yeah, you know, well, it's got that, whatever Jen, yeah. Jen said that was. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, the other thing I'm learning too with mushrooms is that, you know, sometimes you'll see them in the forest just as they're emerging, you know, and then they look different when they're emerging from when they've been out for a while, you know. Right. Um, so I found some birch polypore, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's sort of like a fungus that comes off, looks like a bit of a shelf that comes off of, you know, the for example, the white paper birch is where I, I commonly see them. Okay. Um, and it came out, it was, it was very white and soft and malleable, you know, when it first came out and, and, and kind of goopy and gelatinous in the middle now here we are like a month later and they're kind of a palish brown getting very firm as you know mushrooms are almost 90 percent water so right. they start to dry out and they look different so uh, very important to have a lot of different field guides and resources to cross reference because you may be confused at different times of the season with what you're looking at so then can we make the correlation so i uh, anytime i'm speaking with people or we're talking about things or discussing we always associate habitat to what we're going to see first correct so mushrooms yes. are the same very much the same you know um it's important to when you're you're finding mushrooms to i always tell people 
when you find a mushroom, you must note where it's growing from. Is it growing, you know, directly from, you know, the leaf litter? Uh, is it growing off of a tree stump? Because yeah. um, there's different types of mushrooms, you know, and, and, and what kind of trees are, is it around? Because that really helps narrow things down. You know, for example, there's a couple, you know, different types of mushrooms. Some break down wood uh, and, uh, you know, other kind of leaf litter material. Those are saprophytic mushrooms. Um, you know, for example, you know, we've got the honey mushrooms around here. That's a parasitic mushroom that uh, causes a white rot of, uh, of wood. So a lot of foresters kind of freak out when they see the honey mushrooms on their on their wood on their, yeah, a lot of you know a lot of foragers are like, yes there's honey mushrooms out right now um but uh you know so that one you know it's growing out of wood in clusters you know if it's growing in the middle of a, a grassy lawn in a field and there's no buried wood underneath that's not a honey mushroom that you're looking at right um and also the kinds of trees that things grow on sometimes there's very specific tree hosts or or plant hosts where you're finding them so that's important too. Uh, another kind of mushroom is mycorrhizal mushrooms. Uh, those ones actually help out uh, plants and trees to help, you know, the trees give them sugars for their nutrients and oh. the mushrooms in turn help get the micronutrients from the soil and deliver back, it back deliver up to the tree. Yeah. So some of those mushrooms are not um, say on wood, but they're growing around a certain type of tree mm -hmm. because they're actually, it's, it's a relationship that they have with those trees. So hmm. that's really, really important, you know, when you're, you're trying to identify where am I, where am I, where am I right now? Where am I looking at? What's the kind of tree environment that I have? Look up, you know? Right. Um, cause it's very hard for experts to identify a mushroom you're finding sometimes if you don't say where, where it, it was is. and what and the habitat was yeah, like. Yeah. All and... photographs from different angles. Uh, and we also do spore prints, um, for those who are interested in mushroom foraging. Spore prints are the little, um, seeds, well, seeds as they were <laughs> that, uh, you know, release into the environment to produce other uh, mushrooms, more mushrooms. More mushrooms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they come from that reproductive structure, the actual mushroom itself. Um, and and using the example of the honey mushroom, the honey mushroom has a, a white spore print and we make those by putting the cap of the mushroom, cut off the stem, put it on a piece of white paper uh, and then, or black paper, sometimes you want to do both to kind of see the color there and uh, you leave it 24 hours, then you lift up the cap and you'll see the spores and honey mushroom has a white spore print. Hmm. Um, the honey mushroom has a deadly look-alike called the deadly gallerina here in Ontario and other places as well. That has more of a rusty, brownish sort of spore print. So that's a clue also. Super important to do your spore prints as well as noting what you are around to know what you're dealing with. So that further uh, emphasizes the fact that uh, we're all nature. And mm -hmm. those that follow me know that I'm always talking about that we're part of nature, we're nature. It's not nature and us and it's not us and nature. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all in this together. So here we have mushrooms supporting trees and trees supporting mushrooms right. for the progression. And even when we talk about habitat of various nature, so we're, we're looking at what, what the mushroom is, what the habitat is that are around it, but then there's, as we spoke that day when we were in your cedar, uh, cedar forest, yeah. um, there's various stages of forest as well, yeah, right? So succession. as forests progress through time, there's certain habitat with that, and so mm -hmm. it's kind of the same thing for mushrooms. Just about the uh, spores, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you have a YouTube uh, on your YouTube channel about sporing and how to go about sporing uh, mushrooms and stuff. Yeah, it's included in one of my videos. Yeah. I, I collected a bunch of different mushrooms and I set up, uh, you know, really you know, rudimentary uh, setup there to, to do the spore prints uh, to help me identify some species that were new to me. You know, I may have gotten, very, you know, using uh, this great book here, the North American Mushroom Book, um, you know, I can get so far down a key, but then it says, well, is the spore print white or is it brown? Well, now I have to do the spore print and right. to progress on in the key of my identification. Um, yeah. so, so go to the Wild Yam on YouTube if you wanted to see that video. We'll include all that, all this information and stuff, of course, with the, the video. But mm -hmm. um, there's lots of resources and information on the Wild Yam on YouTube. So follow that. Plus, she shows you great pictures of her cabin. <laughs> <laughs> and I also want to point out, too, there's a lot of good resources online if you're interested in getting into mushroom foraging. and just kind of want to you know follow along to learn a bit. There's a lot of good Facebook groups out there and a lot of other uh, social media groups that help you when you're starting out with mushroom foraging and wild edibles. Um, you know, there's the Ontario Mushroom Foresters and Harvesters Facebook page. Uh, it's a closed group. You have to request permission to join, but there's, that's usually not an issue. And you can kind of follow along. A lot of people will post photographs of mushrooms they found, uh, locations where they found them. Um, you know, generally speaking, a lot of foragers don't really tell you exactly where they yeah. forage because they don't want it to be all gone. Right. Um, but uh, that gets you a sense of the seasonality of some kinds of mushrooms. You're know, finding morels, you know, in the spring and things like that. So you'll start to see what the morels start to look like um, and other mushrooms. Uh, you know, this season we're seeing a lot of turkey tail, uh, lion's mane, that kind of thing. So you'll kind of get a feel for what am I, what could I be seeing out in the woods today? Uh, I also follow a lot of people on Instagram as well um, that sort of
sort of post photographs of mushrooms with their identification. And again, you always be cautious with that, right? Not everybody's an expert. And, yeah. um, but it's, it's good to kind of get the knowledge and verify for yourself. Uh, those things are really helpful. It's a, uh, it's your personal verification and your personal knowledge level that you, you grow. And, but the, uh, the process of uh, elimination is you know learning those steps right mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. so what uh we, i was uh, when you were talking about that and i know that we both have a little affinity for cooking and for food and <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> um what uh so when we think about mushrooms you know like i have my favorite mushroom i get from the store and like that's all that's it you know mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. Uh, what um what tastes different what's the, is there a, a complete and utter 180 degrees away from natural or so are our store-bought mushrooms mm-hmm. to the wild mushrooms mm-hmm. when you cook with them or how do you find that oh yes so that's that's sort of part of the addiction right as yeah. you get uh, interested in, and i might have studied these mushrooms uh uh, really heavily this year and really gotten you know dove in with two feet <laughs> and yes uh, there is quite a different taste even from you know I used to start buying the wild mushrooms as a dehydrated uh, product at you know the local grocery store and you know I found it just sort of ended up tasting like a packaging so yes. I wanted to, <laughs> yeah. to or like a dehydrated mushroom <laughs> yeah exactly exactly so um, you know basically started foraging myself and I've you know had chanterelles um, you know morels and my favorite is hedgehog mushroom which is like a tooth uh-huh. fungus another one that doesn't have uh, deadly lookalikes and it has basically it looks like little teeth underside the cap we talked about the bolites having the pores the hedgehog mushroom has little looks like little hairs little teeth that stick out from underneath it's kind of a cream colored mushroom uh, and grows uh, in the soil on the ground it's a mycorrhizal mushroom and oh my goodness the taste is yeah. fantastic a little bit of butter a little bit of garlic mm. little, little smidgen of salt in there and it's like nothing you've had wow. before um, chandrails have a lovely sort of apricot type of smell to them and they have a, a wonderful texture um, some some are eating more for like sort of texture and the crunch factor. Um, this uh, late summer I foraged uh, for uh, Lactarius thynos, which is a beautiful bright orange mushroom in the Lactarius family. Um, you know, not an amazing flavor there, but the good crunch factor is what you need. Um, some you body know, in the some body, body yeah. you know, into it. Uh, and touching upon. Um, you know, grocery store mushrooms, I don't know if anybody realized, but basically when you're looking at the mushrooms, you know, like the cremini and the portobello, yeah. those are actually all the same species of agaricus, okay? Oh. It's sort of different sort of stages there. So you'll get the very small little creminis and the big portobellos. That's exactly the same species of cultured mushroom, but they can look so different physically. So right. I don't know if a lot of people knew that. Well, and that's my, my go-to is the, the small guys. Like, yeah. yeah. I'll even just eat one. Like, oh yeah. yeah now that's a good point with wild mushrooms you never want to once you've identified they're edible um, through multiple resources and through expert resources and always be a hundred percent careful again when in doubt throw it out but when you are going to eat mushrooms it's very important that you cook them really really thoroughly ah, uh, you never want to eat know that. yeah you never want to eat like people eat in the grocery store you kind of you know whatever you pop one of those little button mushrooms it tastes so good you don't ever want to do that with a wild mushroom and swallow it you know if it's an edible one right good point. Um, because there are certainly even some mild toxins in some of them that are denatured uh, when you cook them thoroughly um, the other thing is some mushrooms do not pair well wild mushrooms in particular with alcohol so there are some you do not want to have a glass of wine with when you're drinking you know eating your you know your wild edible um, because there can be a cross reaction between the alcohol and what's in the wild mushrooms um, so take a yeah. trip and never left the farm as they say <laughs> 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 yeah, wow. so the well, important things go. to consider. And always, too, like when you're foraging and you've determined this is a, a wild edible mushroom that you can eat, um, you always, if you've never had it before and it's edible, you want to have only a small portion of it. And that's what I've practiced, uh, even though how badly I want to eat that mushroom. If I've not had a species before, I'm only going to have a very small amount mm-hmm. and I'm going to save one mushroom of the bunch I've collected that it is because if I you know eat too much and I have an allergic reaction or a gastrointestinal upset at minimum you know um, you know I don't want to be eating a whole whack of it I want to if you have a little bit and I have a reaction then I don't want to be eating a whole lot right um, and you want to save a mushroom from that group that you harvested because if you have a problem and you have to go to the emergency room they need to be able to identify what you ate what you had um, mm-hmm. because there's a situation um, with uh, you know in the Bolete family a Licinium species and it's sort of the one that's quoted a lot on the internet is a uh, you know, a couple had foraged, thought they had what they had, the Licinium species, ate it. Uh, one person died, two people wow. got very ill, and multiple mycologists were involved across North America trying to figure out what exactly they ate. 
um, they weren't 100% what they had foraged for, uh, and they did not save a piece of mushroom to for them to identify. Because I mean, there are lots of experts at poison control that can help out, um, but if you don't save a piece of what you ate, it becomes really difficult, uh, you know, to know what happened there. So yeah, there's a lot of cautions out there in regard to. Um, you can know that. I didn't realize that. that. And it's a very good point. I mean, it's very obvious, actually, after you say it. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> very cool. Very yeah. cool. And I, I certainly, you know, when I'm eating my wild mushrooms, uh, I, I sort of spread them out over many days. I don't sit there and eat a big pile right. of them at once because right. even that, you know, some years, like there's uh, the story of uh, the angel wings mushroom in Japan. There's a huge flush one year. Uh, multiple people got very, very ill. They were con they're considered, you know, edible in small portions, but now they're kind of not because, you know, a lot of people got horribly ill. These people were a bit senior, had uh, kidney disease. Uh, they, 18 days later, developed a severe swelling in the brain and inflammation because a toxin had concentrated within these mushrooms in that particular year, that particular flush. People were eating lots and lots of them because they were just abundant throughout the woods. Hmm. Um, so certainly uh, wild mushrooms aren't something that I would want to just eat piles and piles of every single day in a row. You want to spread it out, you know, because you just never know. Exactly. So when you, th when you think of the composition of a mushroom then from that point of view, it's a fungus. Yeah, exactly. The big kingdom fungi, which is a huge. Yeah. And you see, yeah, there's so much to learn. Like I've never, I'm always going to be learning, you know, yeah, absolutely. There's thousands of species of mushrooms in North America alone. Um, and to think in our climate here too, and it's in relationship to... And correct me if I'm wrong here a little bit, but like you say about the the white uh, mushroom that grows on decaying wood, it's it's a uh, mushroom grows as a result of its habitat. Yeah, exactly. And, and what's decaying and what's yeah. happening. Yeah, they are a tremendous asset in the woodlands. You know, if we didn't have mushrooms, we'd have just piles of dead wood just to, yeah, exactly till forever, right? Yeah. I mean, they're very important to nourish our trees. You know, for the mycorrhizal fungi and the others, the saprophytic fungi. Um, you know, they break down the wood for us and other leaf detritus and things like that. So. Um, you know, and there's a lot of wild medicinal mushrooms out there, which I won't delve into too much, but uh, um, there's lots of research to be done there. Oh, you know, gosh. the chaga, the turkey tail, you know, all, all the, the great medicinal mushrooms. Stuff. Yeah. I know at our place, at a, up a, the, uh, I have a, an edibles book that it's broad. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of things came from Europe, of course, in the 1800s mm -hmm. or thereabouts. And, and uh, most of what was brought was medicinal. You know, yeah. you know, and or used for coffee, and or used for yeah. food, or fire starting. You know, mm -hmm. like the birch polypore and chaga, like they're good tinder fungus. You know, for getting fire mm -hmm. started. So there's and chaga. I mean, uh, is that correct? Yeah, is, yeah. I, we look for that all the time, uh, mm -hmm. so that we can collect it. Uh, some people make tea, correct. apparently. Yeah. Um, but to collect it to, to for fire starts because we go way off in the woods and yeah. what, so you have that that product uh, on, a, on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. um, so lots of stuff to learn, uh, lots of stuff to find out, but this is super interesting uh, about mushrooms and foraging and what have you. And then you can branch out, as you say, yeah. you know, to go off of mushrooms into all kinds of other wild edibles. And, Absolutely. You know, um, yeah. fiddleheads and... Oh yeah, springtime. <laughs> the sky's the limit. Yeah. So before we kind of get this wrapped up and stuff, I um, wanted to talk more about your cabin and that process. and. And everybody likes the outdoors, and and to further your uh, point, in that you uh, you bring the outdoors indoors to you. Yeah. Um, maybe there's some people that would want to comment on uh, some topics that they're just dying to really kind of find out about, but know that they can't do it themselves, uh, and or know where to start themselves. Mm -hmm. Certainly make those comments. But um, when you first got your land. Uh, having come from where you did come from, was there a steep learning curve there for you to say, okay, we're going to, you know, we're, we're, we just bought 170 acres of basically uh, Ontario forest. Mm -hmm. um, well, how'd that go? How did that start? What, the, what was your process there? I, find, I found that interesting in, in, in us all, you know, yeah. to, to be able to do that. Yeah, well, being in the area for, you know, for nine years, I basically uh, had camped a lot and, and got myself very familiar with uh, the region. Uh, and basically decided I, you know, my, my inner peace, it comes from being on the land right. and uh, that's my, where I, I recharge my batteries. Absolutely. And so I had a lot of experience in the woods around that area. And then I decided that, uh, you know, I'd like to spend a lot more time there. So, um, you know, found, uh, the land that we, we have now. And, uh, yeah, so it, it is a really steep learning curve and, the, and, you know, the more, uh, you know, you, you kind of step out into it, the more uh, is given back to you from the land. So, um, yeah, big learning curve, especially we, my husband and I built our, uh, our cabin together. And that was, that was big for me. I was never <laughs> yeah. uh, into doing a lot of construction and things like that. I mean, I've, you know, worked, 
you know, my dad working in the shop and the right. saws and things. I've been, you know, dealing with those kind of uh, things since I was 10 years old, you know, and since I was allowed to use those uh, tools. But to build your own cabin, that's a big uh, learning that's curve as well. Thing, yeah. That was a lot of personal growth there. It was great. The long, hot days in the in the woods yeah, there, like yeah. twelve hour days, trying to get the cabin together. And now here we are, four years later, and it's finally we can say it's it's done. Yes. Um. But uh, yeah, working with the land, you know, we uh, we're part of the uh, the MIF tip program or the Managed Forest Tax Incentive Program, which uh, helps us to to nurture Ontario forests. And so we had a forester come in to discuss the different compartments of our land um, and, and how, how you best can to complement how it. we can complement it, how we can work with it to improve it, yeah. help the local wildlife, the birds, uh, and in turn we get uh, some tax benefits from that uh, it's through the uh, OMNR uh, mm -hmm. and M MPAC actually work together on that um, so I learned a tremendous amount going through the land with a forester you know just sort of a different eye looking at the woods um, you know and, and parts that I thought I just sort of distressed me like you know, all the deadfall and things like that I said, well that's really important habitat uh, you know these big dead standing you know aspens those are great for pileated woodpeckers and and uh, you know this is how you can nurture that you know the bird population on your, on your land the, the the you know we've got a lot of mammals uh, on our land we've got trail cameras to monitor everything so uh, other great content to follow yeah, up with uh, all our trail yeah. camp, trail cam pictures and stuff yeah exactly and uh, we talk you know people that again that follow hear me talking about it all the time in terms of habitat creation even in the urban yard and because the same is true, it's bush therapy, or it's habitat therapy, and mm -hmm. that's what you mm -hmm. gain. Because yeah, exactly. we're all in this together, as we say, it's, we're part of it. So you yeah. you get the vibration and stuff from there. So I know you had a, a few notes and things. Was there any topics, uh, anything that we touched, uh, didn't, didn't touch on that you re found really interesting and wanted to sort of bring up? Bring up? Yeah, you know, certainly in this area, I wanted to touch base on, you know, uh, getting involved more in the wild edibles community. And if you want to learn more and how do you get out and do that, uh, there's a few groups and a few people that are, are quite helpful. Uh, I just went out in a mushroom foraging event uh, last weekend through the, the Friends of the Ferguson Forest Centre. Um, they in had, uh, Yeah, in Kempville. Beautiful woodlands out there. Um, they had uh, someone who's very experienced with foraging lead a group, and I think 80 people uh, wow. came out. Uh, so it's a great That's event. Cool. Uh, and it was really neat because, you know, we all kind of scattered off into the bush and uh, you know would pick specimens and uh, the, uh, the woman involved in, in running the event um, you know would discuss uh, the certain mushrooms and you also got to meet a lot of like-minded people that love you know the bush life and foraging and things like that and you can get experience not only from the you know expert running the the program but make contacts in the community with other people who are, are like-minded um, so that's a great resource um, there's other groups too um, there's a uh, you know sea paws uh, essentially had done a, a talk about uh, wild foraging, wild edibles, and uh, we had Amber Westfall. Uh, so we had Amber Westfall, uh, you know, come in and chat with the group, and she uh, has a farm out on the east end, and she sort of farms and collects wild edibles uh, responsibly and sustainably, um, you know, so there's some left for, you know, the animals and, and other people, and that we're not, you know, like, you know, just over harvesting and things like that. So she leads very interesting talks there at her place. Um, and uh, she actually has a monthly program where you can uh, pay a certain amount of money and it's kind of like you get you know organic vegetables to your door well she delivers or you know the organic wild edibles and wild edible products uh, to your door here in Ottawa and I'm not sure her sort of her catchment area there but certainly uh, if you want to get in touch with her uh, her website is the wildgarden.ca uh, Amber Westfall great resource for information on wild edibles in the community and does wild medicines uh, and and delivers sort of these these boxes to your place uh, which is which is awesome. I know this kind of thing happened in the city, yeah, but yeah, it does, yeah. right? There you go. Um, yeah, and the other uh, you know other interesting things uh, we have uh, something in Ottawa called the Hidden Harvest, um, where groups of volunteers go out and they'll harvest sort of nuts and fruits on public and private land. And, uh, and how that works is there's sort of a, a leader that goes out to these locations. There's, you know, butternut trees or, you know, there's a, you know, a crab apple tree or, um, you know, walnuts, for example. Uh, a group of a few volunteers go and harvest uh, these these edibles. It would normally just go to waste. You know, yeah, they, they go to go seed, they go to ground, they rot. Yeah. Right. So we're, but we're losing important food for our community. So how it works is uh, with the hidden harvest is that I think a quarter uh, goes, uh, you know, to the community uh, through, you know, distribution programs for food, a quarter to the landowner, a quarter to hidden harvest and uh and a quarter obviously to the volunteers that are helping out so right. that's it's really helpful hidden harvest uh so it's like it's ottawa.hiddenharvest.ca uh, uh, if you're interested in learning more about that it's a pretty popular kind of group uh, so sometimes you have to wait to kind of get involved uh you know with a foraging event but it's really helpful and sort of diverting some you know really useful food uh, nutrition into our community and not letting it rot on the ground so that's perfect mm -hmm. i think that's it 
fantastic thing and a great segue. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so I wanted to thank uh, the Wild Yam for showing up and having this fantastic discussion with us today. Be sure to follow her on YouTube, uh, Instagram, and all those uh, social media channels for a huge resource that she does. She uploads a video on her YouTube channel every Sunday morning, faithfully. How long <laughs> have you done that for? Oh boy, probably about a year and a half now. There you go, and, every uh, lots Sunday. Lots of content, you'll not be bored. I can, yeah. And there's a lot, it's a true variety channel, so there's lots of stuff on there, uh, you know, uh, Check out what you like and go from there. Yeah, leave us a comment. Let us know what you're interested in. And uh, maybe we can brew it up because we get tons of stuff here. Our YouTube channel has got, I think I got 79 videos, I think, on our YouTube channel. How many videos do you have in your YouTube? Oh, boy. I think over 100 for sure. <laughs> yeah. so Perfect. Lots of good stuff. And you check out our, uh, the collaboration we did together here at the yes. Google Bluebird store. That so was fun. Yeah, it was fun. It was the solutions uh, at your cabin, you know, for, for birding and things like that. So uh, if you're interested in that kind of uh, content, uh, Bob and I did a great uh, discussion there on that. So it's on my channel as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bob, for having me. It's always a pleasure. You betcha. <laughs> check out the Wild Yam. Bye for now. <laughs>